Hi, everyone. My name is Angie. I'm a St. Louis Zoo educator, and I am so excited that you are here with me today. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about art. <laughs> I see some highs in the chat. Hi. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about art and ways that we like to be artistic. And we'll talk about ways that we can look at animal adaptations as being artistic. And then I have an art project to get you started on. Um, so first we're going to go over some features of the Zoom app and some of our community guidelines. Uh, so here we have our, our community learning standards. Um, so everyone is agreeing to these. Um, if you are here, I will be friendly and respectful of others in my interactions in the chat box. I will use the Q&A box. That's the, the, the chat and the Q&A boxes. Um, if you haven't found those yet, those are either at the top or the bottom of your screen. I'll use the Q&A box for relevant and appropriate questions. I will use the chat box to respond and interact in regards to the webinar topic. And I understand that if the moderator of the webinar has asked, asked me to alter my behavior in the chat, I may be removed from the webinar. So keep those things in mind, um, just so that we can all have the most fun and best learning experience. Um, so before we get started, I, most of you have found the chat box and the Q&A box. You can ask questions anytime throughout the program. I'll get to the questions at the end, um, but please ask them at any time. Um, sometimes it, it, there's a little bit of a lag if everybody asks at the end, and then we might not get to all the questions. Um, so uh, if you think of a question while we're talking about an animal, just quickly type it into that um, Q&A box. Um, Connor is my um, uh, behind the scenes person today and he is helping out um, with moderating the chat um, and doing a few other things. So thanks, Connor. Um, uh, at the end, we'll take an enjoyment poll and we'll actually have some polls throughout our program. And I really like the polls. I hope that you do too. Um, so it'll just ask you a question and then you can put in your answer. Um, so at the end, we'll ask you how much you enjoyed it. And that just gives us some feedback on what programs everyone really likes, what ones we can do more of, and that way you get the best, um, the best programs for what your interest is. All right, I think that we are ready to get started. Okay, so I wanna know, type in the chat, um, oh, and I forgot to tell you or ask you, um, can you put in the chat where you're uh, zooming in from and how many people in your home are watching or are participating? I'll let, let you get those in. Oh, it looks like Columbia, Missouri. And I did hear that there's a classroom joining us today. That's pretty exciting. From St. Louis, from right here, <laughs> from Florida. Wow. Granite City, Wildwood. It looks like it must be Mrs. Hayes' class. I see a lot of Mrs. Hayes there. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for zooming in with us today. All right. Now, when you're typing in the chat, I want you to type in ways that either you are you are artistic or ways that you know of that people can be artistic. So think about ways, all the different ways that people could be artistic. What are some different types? Yeah, for sure. Lots of, oops, looks like my internet is messing up a little bit. Okay, my internet froze for just a second. Sorry about that. Ooh, sketching and drawing. What about, does anybody play an instrument? Sculpting, I see sculpting there too. Oh, someone used to play an instrument? Oh, the clarinet, the guitar. Yeah, I tried to learn the ukulele. That didn't work out so well for me. My areas of art are definitely not the musical kind. Yeah, does anybody sing? You like to sing? That's art too, sure. Um, so there's all kinds of different art. There's, does anybody like to dance? Yeah, you can show me your best dance moves. One of my, um, my boss, actually her son, does the sloth dab and I think that's hilarious. It looks like this. That's pretty good, huh? Yeah, harmonica, somebody plays harmonica. Cool. All right, well, there's basically unlimited ways that people can create art. 
I've even seen orange peel art. Like that's crazy wild creative. That's awesome. So there's unlimited ways. Now, sometimes when we look at an animal adapt, blah, blah, blah. I'm getting tongue tied. When we look at an animal adaptation, sometimes we think about it as a form of art. So an adaptation is anything that an animal has or does to help it survive. And so if it's doing something or making something, we might look at that as art. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen now. It doesn't always work for me. So we'll see how it does. All right. And if you can't see that, um, type it in the chat and Connor, if you could let me know if it's not coming up. And right now the share screen is, um, in the way of my point thing button. There we go. All right. So some ways that we look at animal art is through dance. So all kinds of different animals dance. Honeybees dance. This is a, a red cap mannequin. This is a bird that dances. Skunks dance. This is a peacock spider. It's a teeny tiny little spider that dances. This is a bearded dragon that dances. So all of these different animals dance in totally different ways. I'm gonna, I, I want, I'm gonna pull up a, oh wait, no, not yet. I'm not gonna pull up a poll yet. So I want you <laughs> to type in the chat, why do you think these animals dance? And I can't actually see, let me see if I can exit so I can see the chat. Stop sharing so I can see the chat. Why would they want to dance? To scare away predators? Oh, some people said they couldn't see my share. Um, to impress females, they dance when they talk to each other. All right. There's so many different ways that an animal would, or reasons an animal would want to dance. So a bearded dragon kind of spreads its arms like this and does a little bob. And that's either to say, hey, this is my space, stay away. Or it's to say, hey, this is my lady, stay away. Um, so it's a way to communicate. If you think about honeybees, they do a funny little figure eight dance where they'll kind of go in one circle and then go in the other circle. And then when they walk through the middle of their circles, they wiggle their little bottom. And that's their way to communicate that um, to the other honeybees where they all want to go, where the best flowers would be. Okay, so that's their direct figuring out what direction they want to fly. Um, the red cap mannequin, you should Google that later. That's really cool. It kind of just jump glides across a branch and that's to impress the ladies. And apparently it's really competitive. Um, the peacock spider does kind of a fun little dance. If you want to stretch your arms a bit, you can do it too. They kind of go up and they kind of go down, up, down, up, down. Yeah kind of a good arm exercise there. Um, and the skunk does the little stompy dance to say, hey, stay away, I'm gonna spray you if you don't back up. So a lot of dancing is actually communication either by saying stay away or saying, hey, I'd be a great partner or something like that. All right, I'm gonna share again. Here we go. All right, so our slide is about Singing. Um, oops, redo. Singing isn't just for birds. Other animals can sing too. Um, so we have animals like this type of millipede. This is a special millipede that sings to woo its mate. So um, it sounds kind of like Morse code. If you've ever heard of that, it's like a clicking sound. Um, so that's what it sounds like to us. But um, that's how they um, impress their partner and tell their partner that they're not trying to eat them, that they're not a predator. So it's a way to communicate. These are humpback whales. And um, in the South Pacific, they follow musical trends that change by the season. And the songs actually move across the world. And so they trend at different seasons. And um, they'll, they'll last maybe a year or two. And then you can, the scientists can tell um, that that song has caught on in a different area. And so I think that's pretty cool because songs for people catch on also and, and are trending. Um, so this is an Alston singing mouse. It does more than just chirping to each other. They actually 
have different types of chirps. So they have their talking to each other chirp. And then they have their singing to each other chirp. And these, they can hold a tune for as long as 16 seconds. Now, I think that's pretty impressive. I certainly cannot do that. Um, and they each have their own distinctive song. Um, so it, I think that's pretty neat that a little mouse can have such a neat song. And something else, a little side note that's special about these mice is that they have conversations, which most animals don't do. So they, they talk and the other mouse listens and then they, they trade where then the next mouse talks. A lot of animals will talk over each other, kind of like um, this toad fish. They make really, really loud songs and you can even hear them outside of the water. Um, they're so, so loud. Um, certain bats have songs, not every, every type of bat. Um, so uh, different bats do and different bats don't. And they're different than the echolocation that they use. And this is a little ground squirrel. It looks kind of like a chipmunk, but it's a little bit different than the kinds that we have in Missouri here. Um, it's um, known to sing even while it has food in its mouth. It's a Harris's antelope squirrel. I think they're pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna switch over to, we talked a little bit about what animals do. So they sing, they dance. We're gonna talk about what they make. So here is a robin. Most of us have seen a robin. And they make these really blue eggs. Connor's gonna pull up a poll for me. And I wanna know why do you think these eggs are blue? Do you think it's to distract or trick predators? Do you think it's to inform their partner about the health of the babies? Do you think it's to blend in with their surroundings like camouflage? Or do you think it's their favorite color? All right, I see a lot of great answers. All right, we're gonna end our poll in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so we've got our answers in. A lot of people thought a lot of different things. I personally, like, why isn't it just their favorite color? It's not, that's just silly. So a lot of people thought that it was to distract or trick predators. A lot of people thought it was each of these. So if you thought it was one of these and you didn't get it right, don't worry about it because um, you got to learn something new today. So robin eggs are blue to tell their partner that they are healthy. And that way they know that the babies are more likely to be healthy. And uh, mom robins and dad robins both help take care of the babies. So if the dad Robin sees that those eggs are the perfect shade of blue and he knows that mom is healthy and he'll be more likely to take care of those eggs and the babies when they've hatched. So it's a way to communicate that mom is healthy, the babies are probably healthy, so he'll spend more time taking care of them. So that's kind of a weird way to use art to communicate. Oh, let's see. All right, we're gonna switch over to Japanese quail. It's a little tiny ground bird, looks like this. Um, it lives in Asia. It eats seeds and insects. It nests on the ground, so not in, not in a tree like our robin did. Um, it nests in grassy fields, and its eggs are speckled. All right, Connor's gonna pull up another poll for us. And I wanna know, do you think these eggs are speckled to blend in, to irritate predators, to inform their partner of the health of the babies, or it matches the curtains in their kitchen. What do you think? All right, we'll end in five seconds. So make sure you get your guess in in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, Connor's gonna stop the, the poll for us. All right, great answers, friends. So the Japanese quail uses those speckles. I'll pop the bounce out of that. Okay, uses the speckles to blend in. But this isn't like any other bird that I know of. Their speckles, each bird has a different pattern of speckles. Some have bigger speckles, some have smaller uh, blobs or speckles on there egg and some are slightly different colors. Some are more greenish, some are more brownish, some are darker, some are lighter. And so the first time the mom lays eggs, 
she might lay them in an area that doesn't match. It doesn't blend in with her eggs. So she has to learn what her eggs look like to figure out where she needs to lay them so that she can find the best camouflage. So she might have really dark brown eggs and lay them in an area that's really light colored. And then she says, oh, that didn't work great that time. Next time I'll find an area that is darker and blends in better. That's a pretty cool adaptation. All right, last bird here. This is one of my favorites. It's a tinamou. They're really cool. They don't fly much. They can fly a little bit, not much, but they spend most of their time on the ground. They're from South America. They eat seeds, leaves, fruit, insects, things like that. Um, they nest on the ground just like the, the um, Japanese quail. Um, and they live in the shrubland. So it was similar to the Japanese quail, but their eggs are not uh, brown and speckled. They are bright, shiny green. Sometimes they're more of a brownish green, but they are always shiny and they're pretty bright. Most often they are really, really bright. Um, what, what do you think that is? Um, Connor's going to pull up one more poll for us. And I want to see your guess. Do you think it's to um, protect them against germs, to notify other animals of their location? Scientists just don't know for sure. Or because they just like to have the fanciest eggs of all. What do you think? What could it be? I'm gonna give you five more seconds to get your guesses in. So think about what that reason could be. Protecting germs, um, notify other animals, or scientists just don't know. Um, so five, four, three, two, one. All right. So we had a lot of great guesses. It was pretty even throughout the whole board there. Um, so I'm gonna exit out of my poll. Tinamou eggs are bright and shiny, and scientists aren't really sure why. They have a few guesses though. So their guesses are that that shiny layer protects them from other germs that might be on the ground. So maybe it's a nice extra layer to keep their baby safe. That could be. Another guess, so if you guessed any of those top three guesses, any of those would be right. Um, the other reason they believe is to notify other animals of their location. Now, not just any animals, not like um, Bob the emu walking by. It wouldn't be like that. It would be like um, other tinamous. So tinamou moms all lay their eggs together in one nest. I'm going to exit out of my share screen here because um, I do have a piece of shell here that I wanted to show you so you can see it is shiny like it feels like glass um, so if you were to touch your mirror it that's what a tinamou egg feels like you can see the reflection in it um, but tinamou moms all lay their eggs together to help protect the eggs um, uh, they they put all their eggs together so let's say tinamou mom um, lays two eggs usually they lay about four eggs over four days so let's say she lays two eggs in her nest and a snake comes over and eats two eggs. She has zero eggs left. But let's say she lays her eggs with three other moms. They've got a bunch of eggs there all mixed up together. Let's say that same snake comes over and eats two eggs. Now she might have one egg eaten, but chances are she's not gonna have both of her eggs eaten. Somebody else's egg is gonna get eaten. So it gives her babies a better chance to survive if she lays them together with other moms. So when they're that bright color, it's kind of a signal, hey, egg laying over here. This is where we're laying our eggs. And then the, the, um, the Tinamou mom, that's kind of the boss mom, um, she's the one that, that sits on the eggs most of all. All right, let's see. I'm gonna pull up just a little bit more of PowerPoint um, and and then we'll talk about our art project. And remember, it's a Q&A if you've got some questions. Okay, so we'll go past this adorable Dinamo. And I'm gonna blast through all the rest of these um, uh, art uh, things. 
So we have a knobbed whelk. That's a little shell, this little, um, oops, it's not coming on the screen very well. There it goes. Um, it's, a, it's a little sea snail or a big one, um, depending how old it how old it is. But they make these really cool egg cases that are all twisted up. These are weaver birds. We have a different type of weaver bird at our zoo. Um, and they've got these crazy awesome nests and their nests are really beautiful. Um, this is one of my favorites, the spittle bug. Like what a cool bubbly nest. The tailor bird is really good at sewing. So a tailor is someone who sews. Well, this bird pokes a hole in the leaves, holes in the leaves, just enough so that the leaf doesn't die. But they use spider webs and other um, thread sort of things to make these nests fit together. And then they can feed their little babies inside. It's almost like an ice cream cone of baby birds. It's pretty cute. And there's another one. This is a spongilla fly cocoon. It's just this regular old looking fly, but it makes a beautiful, beautiful cocoon here. Um, and it has this weird outside layer and scientists really aren't sure why they make that. So if you wanna do more research, you know, you can check that out and see if you can figure it out. And um, this is an Osmia avoceta bee um, and it makes these cool co or, um, uh, little nests that are made with uh, petals. As a harvester ant nest. And scientists think that those, that beautiful um, walls around it, that that protects the nest from um, water rushing in. And this is a decoy spider. And this is what we're going to focus on for a little bit. It just looks like any regular old spider, but this is pretty special. It lives in South America and also in Asia. It's a little spider. And this spider builds a bigger spider. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, let me get out of there. All right, so this little spider builds a bigger spider. Why do you think it would do that? I want you to type in the chat what you think. All right, oh, someone said something about a puffer fish. I actually have a picture of a puffer fish and the beautiful art that they make. Um, so that's a puffer fish. And that's the puffer fish nest and it is beautiful and it's huge that's bigger than me and this fish is about like that big all right so ways that um all right to keep predators away yeah somebody said they don't know well you're gonna find it out in just a little bit um to scare predators awesome so this little bitty spider makes a little bit bigger spider in their nest and they use recycled materials to do it. So they'll use bits of leaves. They'll even use old uh, pieces of, so when they eat something like a fly, they don't eat the whole fly, they eat the inside. So they'll use those bits and pieces to make their um, spider replica or their self portrait, if you will. And that is so that if a bird sees a little spider on a web and a big spider on them, that bird is gonna wanna eat the big spider because that's a bigger meal, that's, that's more worth it. And so they might swoop in and grab that big spider and fly away. And the little spiders left over there saying, hey, bye, see you next time. And the big spider's not a real spider, so the little spider can just always make a new one. So I think that's pretty cool. And we are going to actually use the art from that spider as our inspiration to make art today. So I'm going to talk about the art and then do our Q&A portion. So you're going to think of an imaginary animal. It could be any animal you, met, you want. Um, I made Babazilla here. So here is Babazilla. Babazilla is um, like a sheep and a lizard put together. And um, it needs, I want you to think about why your animal would need a decoy. And my animal has the best fluffiest fur and all the other animals want the fluffiest fur. So to protect herself, she's got to build a decoy so that the other animals don't get her fluffiness. So the way that you're going to do this, you're going to use recycled materials, whether it's from your recycle bin or if it's something that you found outside or if it's even junk mail. Junk mail is usually bright and pretty. And so you can rip that up and um, make your artwork. Only you're not going to draw your decoy over here. You're going to make it with other stuff, that recycled stuff. Um, now, I have, my neighbor gave me a, a beautiful flower and um, I'm going to use one of the petals from her flower to make my uh, decoy here. So I'm going to use my glue stick and you can use whatever you want to glue it on. So there's part of the fluffiness, but I'm not done yet um, because I've got more fluffiness. I need to make it um, have a long tail here. 
Sorry about the wobbliness. I'm gluing my, my animal right in front of you. Um, so I collected some fuzzies from outside. We've got a cottonwood tree, and it's just going crazy right now. So I'm going to stick some of those on. Whoa. Look at that decoy. That's pretty impressive, huh? I know. You're very impressed with my decoy, Babazilla. Um, so this is going to be your, your art project for the day, should you choose to accept the challenge. Um, and uh, that's not a real animal, though, of course. So you can make up your own silly animal, um, or you can think about why any real animal would want a decoy. Maybe you want to pretend that a lion needs a decoy. It's up to you. It's your artwork. You can do whatever you want. All right, I'm gonna take some questions. And if you have questions about the art project, let me know. Um, I'm gonna check these questions out. Ooh, there's some fluffies floating around. Um, do we have any of these birds at the zoo? We do have um, a different species of weaver bird at our zoo, and we also have tinamou. Um, and tinamou are really cool. They're found in our birdhouse, and um, you'll see them walking around on the ground because they don't, they don't fly much, so they don't go in the branches, really. How much eggs can a bird make? It depends on the bird. Some birds lay one egg, and some birds lay a few eggs. Um, the tinamou lays four, about four eggs over four days, and then they sit on their eggs um, together like we talked about. Do woodpeckers lay eggs? Woodpeckers do lay eggs. I don't know how many eggs they lay. Do you have any bald eagles? I think we have one bald eagle at the zoo. I'm not sure if she's still there or not, um, but you can, um, I can check back into that. Um, I find robin eggs everywhere. Do parents push out the non-healthy eggs? Usually all the eggs are the same color because that shows the mom's health. And so all of the eggs will look about the same. Oh, and I forgot to mention that blue color can also help protect the eggs from the sun. So if they're not too dark, not too light, just the perfect color, then that helps reflect enough light, but also pull in just enough. All right. Can we pet a tinamou? No, tinamou are wild animals. So um, you can't pet a tinamou at our zoo. You can look at them, though. You can look really closely at them. Um, and they're, they're pretty used to people at the zoo, so they don't mind if you, if you walk right, right next to their habitat. Like, of course, not reaching into it. <laughs> You're not going to do that, but you can get really close in our birdhouse. Um, oh, how big are Boris? It, I'm guessing you're asking about Boris and Natasha, the, um, the vultures, the scenarios vultures. They're full ground, grown. I don't know. Um, they're, they're real big. Like, I don't know how to explain this to you. They're real big, <laughs> uh, so I don't I don't know um, like in inches or anything. Why do I find the eggs everywhere? I'm thinking you might be talking about robin eggs um, and other bird eggs that would be in your area, um, and uh, th that's because usually the nests are in a tree, and then way beach out the, the shells fall down, um, so you'll find a lot of the shells on the ground. Um, all right, well, we have one more poll. Connor, if you could pull up our enjoyment poll. Let me know if you if you liked it, didn't like it. And if you have more feedback for us, you can type it in the chat or email us. We're gonna pull up um, an email at the very end. Um, you'll see on a slide um, about uh, an email. So if you have extra questions or if you wanna tell us um, some good feedback for us, then just let us know. Exit out of that. So today we talked about some mutations that we can look at as being artistic. Um, we learned about a spider and hopefully you were inspired to make some art, um, inspired by that spider to make some art. Um, and if you want to email us, if you make that art project, please email us. I would love to see some of this awesome artwork that um, is out there. Well, it's about time to go. Thank you all so much for coming and visiting with me. I hope you all have a great day. Bye.